Hi, I want to talk a little bit more about analysis of variance and work through a little activity I used in class to illustrate how analysis of variance works. So on the left here I've got the definitional formula for the sums of squares, total, among and within, and I'll come back to those in a moment. On the right I've got a scenario, an oil patch being compared to two control or reference patches in terms of number of mangrove seedlings. And you can see the data is there. And um, the oil patch, for instance, had one, four and five seedlings in the three replicates. And you can see the numbers there for the other two sites, means and variances. Now, as I explained yesterday, these data are real data, but this situation is not. So the data actually came from an experiment I did during my honours year on Waratah sea anemones, these little guys here, which are common on the uh, southern and eastern coast of Australia. So I turned it that set of data into an environmental situation for the purposes of explanation. Anyway, moving on and a focus on the left here for the time being. You can see I've got sums of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square and F value for those data. Um, the degrees of freedom for among is just the number of groups take away one, so three minus one gives me two. Number of degrees of freedom for within is up there, n minus k, so k is the number of groups, big N is the total number of observations. If it's a balanced design with the same number of replicates in all treatments or all groups, then we can alternatively work out degrees of freedom for within as k times bracket n minus 1 bracket. So it's the number of groups times the degrees of freedom for each individual group. Either way we get 6 and so the total degrees of freedom is total number of observations take away 1. Total sum squares and total degrees of freedom here are only used as a check that the other calculations are correct and often these days those will be left off analysis of variance tables because they're not actually used for anything. Um, they are of uh, the total sum of squares is of more importance when it comes to regression. Anyway, I mentioned an activity, so here we go. Sorry, that's a blank page. Here we go. You see up the top of this Excel sheet, I've got the information copied from the graphic I was just looking at. So I've got the data, means, variances, and then the analysis of variance table underneath that. And the one thing I've added in here is I'm using Excel's functions to get the p-value associated with that f, which as you can see is less than 0 0.05, so this is a significant test and I would reject the null hypothesis. Now, how does, the null, how does analysis of variance test the null hypothesis? Back to PowerPoint and over a page. On the right, um, things to do with the assumptions, which I'll come back to. On the left, down the bottom here, I've got the definitions for what the among and within mean squares actually estimate. And one thing I've tried to emphasize here is that these numbers are not magical fantasy numbers. They actually represent something that relates to the real world. So sigma squared w is variance associated with um, variation within a site. So it's a measure of variation within a site. So if you remember um, the numbers 
Here we are. 1, 4, 5. Obviously, each quadrat, each sample, doesn't have the same number of seedlings, so there's some variability or variation within the site. And mean square within estimates that variability. One reason that we need the assumption of equality of variance is, be, is because we are, we are assuming that there is one number, sigma squared w, and the analysis of variance rests on that assumption. I'll come back later and we'll see how important that is. So within just estimates that and critically the among estimates sigma squared within plus variation among groups. Now strictly speaking for a fixed factor I shouldn't be putting it in there as a sigma squared term which re refers to a, a random variance. I should put it in there as a sum of treatment effects, but that's more complicated to write. It measures variation among groups. Now critically, if there is in fact no variation among groups, that term does not exist. It's equal to zero. And then we have two different estimates of variation within groups. Dividing one estimate by the other should give us an F ratio around about one. So that's the basis for the F-test in the analysis of variance. If there is no variation among groups, both estimates are about the same, and we should get an F ratio around 1. OK, so back over here, I've got the numbers down there from the analysis of variance, but just put out in a single row. What I've done here is write some code to randomize the data. So in simple terms what it does is it just picks two of these numbers, a random two of these numbers, and switches them around. And the code does that a thousand times. And once that's been done a thousand times, those numbers are going to be well and truly shuffled. It doesn't get new numbers, it uses exactly that set of numbers there. And once it's shuffled the numbers, it calculates the analysis of variance. So, press the button, and away it goes. Now, it's just done a thousand runs of exactly that. And if we start going down and looking at the F values, they vary. So you can see a 5.2, 2.8, 0.3, but they tend to be around about 1. And if we look at the graph over here, most of the values are somewhere between naught and about 2. Values of F larger than that are uncommon. They occur, but they are uncommon. And if you look here at the um, among mean square and within mean square, they tend to be similar. 25.3, 25.9. That's because by shuffling the data around, I have gotten rid of group differences. I've destroyed any structure in the data. And now there's just three groups of numbers. Now, because the data are not normally distributed, uh, I wouldn't expect these numbers to be not normally distributed because they are counts out of 15 of anemones which remained in the study experimental plots. So the values can only go 0 to 15, and they can't be anything else. And it's very unlikely that the means are going to be normally distributed. Looking at the variances there, they don't look the same, but variances are notoriously variable, especially when there's a few replicates. So if I go back here, um, the test that we commonly did at that time was a Cochrane's test and the calculated value there 0 0.6 is less than the table value 0 0.9 so according to that test there's no significant difference among the variances even though to just looking at it it does it appears that there is now regardless of whether there is or is not a difference in variances
the assumption of normality is certainly not going to be true. However, however, if we look at the p-value for the randomized data, and all I'm doing here is I am going to this table, or this graph, looking up where the value for the real data is, which is 7.08, so it's right in that group there, and, and I'm just looking at how many values are bigger than it. So it has rank 4 if I rank them from um, largest to smallest. So there are three, uh, uh, sorry, there are four values if I include it as big as 7 or larger. There's a thousand f values there in total, so I'm getting a p value of 0 0.004. So regardless of whether I get the p value from the f distribution, which requires normality and homogeneous variances, or whether I get it from randomization, the null hypothesis is certainly rejected either way. And the fact that the f values here tend to be round about 1 and tend to follow the f distribution reasonably closely indicates that those assumptions are not really that important. As I say in other videos, analysis of the variance is robust to moderate departures from those assumptions. Very large departures from assumptions will cause problems, and some of some kinds of departures cause more problems than others. But um, in general, moderate or small departures from the assumptions are of no concern at all. Now, um, so I think I've covered just about everything I was going to. The last thing I want to do is just go over here. The code for doing this is surprisingly easy to write and surprisingly small. I've basically got a routine here which just, as I said, shuffles the numbers around. Actually it's doing a hundred, not a thousand. It does a thousand runs in total. Um, and then here I calculate the means of the groups and that's because I use the definitional, definitional formula to calculate the sums of squares. Uh, if you're using calculator, this is a tedious way to do it. Of course, it requires two runs through the data, but for a modern computer, uh, it really makes no difference in terms of the calculation time. Well, it probably makes some difference, but it's too small for me to know. So up here, sums of squares 1 is the mean for the group. Take away the grand mean and square it, add it up for the three groups. So that's sum of squares among sum of squares within here is take the mean for the group, take the mean, sorry, take every observation, take the mean for the group away, square it and add those numbers up. And then lastly sum of squares total is just the group, uh, the observation, take away the grand mean, square that and add that up over all the observations. Um, so that's doing the analysis of variance, and if I go right down the end here, for 0 to 999, so that's a thousand runs. If the run is greater than zero, so for the first ten, for the first run through, I use the original data to calculate the ANOVA. After that, I shuffle the results and do the whole thing again. So back here and back here. These numbers actually have meaning. So 10.22 there is, a, or let's say 10, is an estimate of variability within a site. As we've rejected the null hypothesis, we know there is differences among the groups. And so if I take 72.33, take away 10.22, that gives me 61.11 or about 60. Variation among the groups, treatment effects, is about 60. Uh, and that's 
roughly six times variation within groups. Now, across the page here, I've got the basic layout for a standard two-factor design, where uh, two-factor cross design. Everything I've said about one factor there applies to a two-factor. And if the factors are fixed, as they will be in many cases, then the terms here stay much the same. Within mean square, again, estimates within variation within the group. Factor A estimates variation within the group plus effects of factor A. Factor B, variation within the groups plus effects of factor B. And then interaction variation among the groups plus int, uh, any interactive effect. Now, that applies so long as the design is balanced. If the design is unbalanced with more replicates in some treatments than in others, then these sources of variation are not orthogonal and they overlap and things become a little bit more complicated, although it depends on the extent to which there is differences in that numbers of observations. For instance, if it's balanced, except one replicate is missing from one treatment, then there'll be some slight confounding of sources of variation, but only slight. Anyway, what I wanted to do there was just illustrate what these terms actually mean, show how we could alternatively test the null by randomizing the data or permutating the data, and this is increasingly being done. As I say in class yesterday, I've got a big green book on uh, numerical ecology, uh, and I've got another book on numerical ecology with R, and many, many of the tests in those books are permutational tests based on randomizing the data or mixing the data up. What the key thing that I want to get out of this is that once I destroy the structure in the data, then the among mean square and within mean squares are different estimates of the same number within group variability. And the F ratio will tend to be around about 1. Okay.